Blessed Mother, uh, your faith, your yes to the Lord was always ready for what the Lord had for it, whether it included difficulty or blessing, even super abundance of blessing. Make our faith uh, the same. Make it more and more that open womb for whatever the Lord has for us. We receive and trust and faith and love. Remember, the most gracious Virgin Mary, that Amen. never was in that anyone who had denied protection, even the Lord thy help, or self in intercession, was left unneeded, inspired by this confidence, we cry unto thee, O Virgin of Virgin's Highway, to thee to be God, before the Lord Jesus Christ, since the moment of sorrow. O Mother of the Word in your heart, you despise not our petitions, but you have your mercy to you here in this house. Amen. God of superabundance, overflowing with grace, overflowing with love, and guide this conference, guide our minds and hearts, uh, guide us to open ourselves uh, for you yourself. We ask this and through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord Jesus, throughout the Gospels, uh, says something very challenging to us, just about the importance of faith. He'll say things like, Let it be done unto you according to your faith. So much depends on our faith, that a receptivity to what the Lord has for us. Let it be done unto you according to your faith. I wonder how much uh, he says that to us with respect to uh, the spiritual life and the mystical life. Let it be done unto you according to your faith. We've been talking a lot about the theological virtues and the power of faith, hope, and charity for bringing us into contact with the Lord. The power of faith, but even, you know, the power of hope. It too is a theological virtue, reaching out in hope to the Lord. Let it be done unto you according to your hope as well. Right? One receives as much as he hopes for. John the Cross says, Treslis who says. So there's a, a challenge here with our faith, to, to seek the Lord, confidence, faith, uh, to be bold. And of course, uh, Teresa of Avila is great on this theme, right? She warns us from that cowardliness uh, that a false humility uh, can bring us to. But yeah, the power of faith, I think we can underestimate it. All right, so for St. Bernard, it's so simple. Believe and you have found him believe and you, you have found it, you have it. <laughs> but in faith, behind the veil, under the veil. And this faith that the Lord calls us to, let it be done unto you according to your faith, it's not going to be easy. There, there's a trial in there. Listen to this uh, description of faith um, from Francis Xavier Durwell. So this is from his work on the resurrection from 1950. An important book um, that kind of helped open up the idea, you know, salvation comes through the cross, but it also comes through the Lord's resurrection. It's not simply his passion by which we're saved, but also, according to the scriptures, the resurrection of Christ. So he kind of re-emphasized that truth in 1950 with his kind of seminal work on the resurrection. He's a, a redemptorist priest. And um, so this is, he's looking at St. Paul, and here's a description of faith he draws from St. Paul. And uh, you'll hear echoes with John of the Cross. He doesn't refer to John of the Cross. He's just looking at St. Paul, like this is what faith involves. Um, but yeah, so, let's, so faith. This is let it be done unto you according to your faith. Uh, but the faith is going to involve a lot. So um, Father Francis Xavier Durwell, he says, By faith, man gives up making himself the center of his own life. The basis of his own salvation. 
and places that center and basis outside himself in God who gives life in Christ. There is an anguish for man in making this complete reversal and recognizing his fundamental powerlessness and handing himself over to another and delivering himself totally over to the salvific will of God. He lets go of the certitudes within his grasp, abandons the ground he fills beneath his feet in order to believe in a world he cannot see. He trusts his weight to something whose very existence, naturally speaking, impossible, he knows only by God's word. He risks all upon the word of God in Christ. It's for good reason that St. Paul speaks of the sacrificial oblation of faith. Philippians 2.17. So let it be done unto you according to your faith. And to live that faith out is going to be something radical. It's going to involve a whole transfer of everything from ourselves to the Lord, a new center of gravity, a new center, not ourselves, but the Lord. Leaning on dark faith alone, leaning on pure faith alone. We abandon the ground we feel beneath our feet in order to believe in a world we cannot see, trusting our weight to something we only know by the word of God, his promise, reaching out in faith to receive that, risking it all on the word of God in Christ. Right, monastic life, that comes out all the more pronounced. Risking it all on faith, unseen things. That's why it's so difficult. It stretches you. There's a self-emptying in faith that belongs to just the essence of faith itself. A self-emptying, seeing our powerlessness, transferring our hope from ourselves to another, the Lord, whom we can't see, who's hidden, but who's trustworthy, who's all-powerful, who's all-loving. There's a self-emptying inherent to, to the life of faith, a kenosis, a self-emptying of faith, a night of faith. St. John Paul II and his Redemptorius Mater, Mother of the Redeemer, looks at Mary in the night of her faith. He says there's a sort of night of faith for Mary already in the hidden years. Right, with Jesus in Nazareth, raising the God-man in the temple. You know, son, why have you done this to us? Perplexity. Uh, he says it's a kind of veil through which one has to draw near to the invisible one and to live in intimacy with the mystery. Faith, faith is the kind of veil through which one has to draw near to the invisible one and to live in intimacy with the mystery. Then St. John Paul II knows that at the cross, through this faith, Mary is perfectly united with Christ in his self-emptying. Hers is perhaps the deepest kenosis of faith in human history, the deepest self-emptying of faith the deepest self-emptying that faith is in human history, Our Lady, at the foot of the cross. So with faith is that fiat, let it be done unto me according to your word. It's a word that challenges us, but it's also a word that exalts us sometimes, draws us into God's life, his abundance, his superabundance. I think a lot of times, especially in the mystical life, the spiritual life, a lot of times what begins as an act, what begins as an attempt at humility ends as a lack of faith. All right, what can begin as an attempt at humility ends, can end as a lack of faith. That's not for me, that's for others. That's too much. I'm content with much less. But no, yeah, the Lord has high call for all of us. And we begin to live it now. We begin to reach out to it through faith, through hope. Believe and you have found him. Believe and you have found him. The Catechism, the Catholic Church, paragraph 2014, which is, I think, my favorite paragraph in the Catechism. Uh, it says, spiritual progress 
tends toward ever more intimate union with Christ. This union is called mystical because it participates in the mystery of Christ through the sacraments, the holy mysteries, and in him in the mystery of the Holy Trinity. God calls us all to this intimate union with him. Even if the special graces or extraordinary signs of this mystical life are granted only to some for the sake of manifesting the gratuitous gift given to all. There's a lot here and we'll we'll break it open. But I thought uh, in year 2014, I thought, you know what? This should be a year dedicated to paragraph 2014 in the Catechism. (laughs) This is what the church needs to hear. (laughs) But I was in the charter house. um, And so now I have to kind of catch up (laughs) and spend the rest of my life under this paragraph uh, 2014. Yeah, no, there's a, there's a lot here. And it's based on, you might know, in the early 20th century, there were debates about the universal call to the mystical life and whether all are called to infuse contemplation, the mystical life, or if it was just like a second path or something, uh, um, a quicker path there. Um, and as you may know, Dominicans were kind of some of the forerunners in pushing for the universal call to mysticism. And important here is distinctions. Right? You always got to make good distinctions uh, between the ordinary and the extraordinary. Right? What's, what's in the ordinary unfolding of the mystical life? What, what's in the essence? Well, it's the theological virtues and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Union with the Lord through the theological virtues, being elevated uh, with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's the essence. Ordinary. And that is simply the unfolding of the, you know, the seed of grace implanted in us at baptism in the beginning. It's the natural, so to speak, unfolding of grace. It's there. And so the full flowering of grace is the mystical life. Then there's the extraordinary, extraordinary signs of the mystical life. Uh, like the stigmata or something. Uh, that is something that you know, we shouldn't desire. If it comes, it comes, but you shouldn't desire it or, or something. It's not, it doesn't belong to the essence of the spiritual life, the mystical life. Visions don't either. Corporal visions, sensible visions. So then we see the catechism make make that distinction. God calls us all to this intimate union, which it just said it's called mystical. Even if the special graces or extraordinary signs of this mystical life are granted only to some for the sake of manifesting the gratuitous gift given to all. This is really important. And it helps us to understand how we can read texts of the mystics. So let's, let's think about Padre Pio Stigmata. You know, so that's certainly a special grace, an extraordinary sign of this mystical life that's just granted to a few, very few. But it manifests the gratuitous gift given to all. all right, so Padre Pio had an extraordinary share in Christ's passion. Right? Through the stigmata, it shows that. It's an expression of that. However, we all have a share in Christ's passion through our baptism, through uniting ourselves daily at this altar, to Christ's sacrifice. So the extraordinary sign given to Padre Pio and the stigmata uh, manifests the gratuitous gift given to all of us. That's why there's sort of a resonance. That's why we can read like Padre Pio's letters to his spiritual director. You know, there's a volume as he was receiving the stigmata and as he kind of talks about that and the sufferings. He's writing letters to his spiritual director. Now we have a volume of those letters. And that's why we can read those letters and get benefit from them. Because we too have a share in the passion of Christ. And Padre Pio's extraordinary share in it is not unrelated to us and our share in the passion of Christ. So it's helpful to read Padre Pio uh, and about him receiving the stigmata and him working through just the sufferings with Christ. It helps us with our own sufferings we have to bear. The special, all, God calls all of us to this intimate union, even if the special graces or extraordinary signs of this mystical life are granted only to some for the sake of manifesting the gratu- gratuitous gift given to all. So it opens us a way to even read these texts that do involve the, the extraordinary expressions of the mystical life. Another example. Let's think about 
Teresa of Avila and some of her descriptions of spiritual marriage. Let's take an intellectual vision of the Blessed Trinity. Let's take John of the Cross, where he you know, experiences the Holy Spirit spirating in his soul. Okay, we probably don't have the same powerful experience of something like that. But in fact, the same reality is happening in our own soul. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are dwelling there. Father and Son are breathing forth the Holy Spirit. They're spirating the Holy Spirit right now in the depths of our heart. And that spiration also comes out towards us, is directed to us. So if I read John of the Cross on that, and that opens me to the reality of what's happening in my soul, if my love is enkindled by reading this and what's happening in my soul, and I appreciate the gift more, uh, like what a blessing it is to read John of the Cross. Right? We can get afraid sometimes, well, am I really there? Am I... Well, you don't have to worry about that. If it stirs up your love for the Lord and the delight and the gift that you have in the indwelling Trinity, uh, it's all good. <laughs> it's a help. God calls, God calls, us, calls us all to this intimate union with him, even if the special graces or extraordinary signs of this mystical life are granted only to some for the sake of manifesting the gratuitous gift given to all. So it stirs up our appreciation of the gift given to us as well as we read like Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross on these lofty mystical states. And there is a true resonance with them. Even not being in spiritual marriage, there's a resonance because we have the same reality in our souls, the indwelling trinity. That union has begun at baptism, right? John of the Cross, there's one spiritual marriage, the one that begins at baptism. And that's brought to its full flowering throughout our spiritual lives. Spiritual progress tends towards ever more intimate union with Christ. This union is called mystical because it participates in the mystery of Christ through the sacraments, the holy mysteries, and in him in the mystery of the Holy Trinity. So part of that early 20th century debate was, you know, should we pray for the grace of infused contemplation? All right, if that belongs to the extraordinary signs the mystical life, then you shouldn't pray for it. But if it belongs to the ordinary unfolding of the life of grace, you should. And so you can probably tell where I stand on this with that of prayer <laughs> and the anointing of the St. Elizabeth of the Trinity oil, praying for graces of infused contemplation. When I was a, a second year student brother at the Dominican House of Studies, uh, I sat down with my spiritual director, uh, Father Basil, Father Basil Cole, and thought it was time to share with him my desire, my sense of a call to the Carthusians. And he said to me, he said, he said, you have to pray, pray, pray for the grace of infused contemplation. You have to pray for it hard. And so, uh, so daily, so I started, so I incorporated that into my daily prayer life. Graces of infused contemplation. Because it's a gift. But it's a gift that belongs to the ordinary unfolding of, of the spiritual life, of the mystical life. So we're right to pray for it. And it's good to pray for it. And maybe the Lord is just waiting for us um, to pray ardently for it, for more graces along these lines. You know, it's not that extraordinary of a thing. Graces of infused contemplation. And I think when I was a college student and... I was presented the gospel in a clear way. You know, Jesus died on the cross so that I might have a personal relationship with God, receive that in faith to enter into this personal relationship with the Lord. Uh, I think, you know, there's a touch of infused contemplation there. The, the reality opening up before your eyes, you, you, you grasping it in a new way. So these graces aren't like um, rare Right, these uh, moments of infused contemplation. You know, a state, so there's a, another distinction, act versus state. There can be an act of infused contemplation, uh, which isn't rare. Uh, but a more continual state of infused contemplation, you know, that takes more time. Uh, that, that takes, you know, uh, persistence, perseverance. It unfolds over time. 
Um, but yeah, these things aren't, aren't extraordinary. We find them in the scriptures, right? I mean, Ephesians 1, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. I can think, I can't come up with a better definition of infused contemplation than that. And it's from St. Paul. Jesus has promised that he'll manifest himself to us. Uh, Hebrews 6 has an interesting little passage. It, it's easy to miss because St. Paul is saying those who experience these things, they can fall away. And woe to them if they do. Uh, but so people who experience these things, they fall away. But listen to what he says. I mean, this sounds like he just, he's talking to normal Christians here. Uh, those who have been once who have been enlightened who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. Right, that's rich prayer. That's deep prayer. And he's speaking to ordinary Christians here. Hebrews 6, uh, 4, 4 through 5. So we have uh, sort of the basis for this in scripture itself. Yeah, you know, we pondered Ephesians chapter three um, to know what surpasses all knowledge, the breadth, depth, length, and height, to know the love of Christ and to be filled with all the fullness of God. Another description of just grace, prayer, infused contemplation there. Part of the ordinary Christian life. And so to pray for these things, lay hold of them in faith and hope, uh, to follow after the Lord, knowing it's not us, but it's him. And the Lord draws us more deeply to himself, but he needs our faith. He needs our hope, right? Remember that one town, Jesus could not perform any miracles because of their lack of faith. We kind of bind the hands of almighty God with our lack of faith sometimes. All right, it's hard to bind the hands of almighty God, <laughs> but we can do it with our lack of faith. To a certain extent, right? 2014 then of the catechism, then it's important to read it in connection with the, the next paragraph, 2015. The way of perfection passes by way of the cross. There is no holy, holiness without renunciation and spiritual battle. Spiritual progress entails the ascesis, the asceticism and mortification that gradually lead to living in the peace and joy of the Beatitudes. Now, it's interesting, right, that the order of these paragraphs, we might have expected the catechism to put 2015 first, talk about the ascetical life first, mortification, uh, spiritual battle, and then culminating the mystical life. Uh, but no, the catechism wisely speaks about the mystical life first. There's a primacy there, right? Because God's grace always goes before. Even the ascetical life is imbued with God's grace and it's a response uh, to to the uh, the working of God's grace, there's a way in which you know the mystical life is primary. It's even more primary, and the ascetical life flows from that. The early stirrings of uh, God's grace in our lives. So this way of faith, the way of perfection, passes by way of the cross. There is no holiness without renunciation and spiritual battle. Spiritual progress entails the ascesis and mortification that gradually lead to living in the peace and joy of the Beatitudes. So in light of a 2014 and the universal call to the mystical life, you know, so this movement in the early 20th century, this paragraph, 2014, about the mystical life sort of puts the church's stamp of approval on that development in spiritual theology. You kind of hear that debate in the background of, of this paragraph. Uh, and it's the church's seal of approval on this, and it's, it's in the catechism. You know, so little kids in their catechism classes are supposed to be learning this. <laughs> They're learning it, right? Little Johnny, little Mike, and uh, their second grade catechism classes. Um, you know, we're working on that. We're sort of trying to revamp the catechetical <laughs> efforts. Uh, in our day. But yeah, no, it's, 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 it's basic Catholic doctrine. And we're, we're doing our best to, to live it out. What I want to do now, yeah, so, what, so in light of this, the universal call to the mystical life, um, yeah, we should strive for it. But strive for an austere 
mysticism, right? Not things caught up on the surface level, not things caught up in the pretty rather than the beautiful, the beauty of the cross, uh, not caught up in kind of uh, the lace or the uh, cutesy kind of things, consolations, uh, but an austere mysticism, austere mysticism of the depths. That's what we should strive after. That's what John the Cross uh, sets before our eyes. So that delicate touch with the Lord, that spirit-to-spirit contact with him, and an austere mysticism of the depths, what's, what's beautiful, great about it is um, it leads into continual prayer. It's something you can tap into. Whatever mood you're going through, whatever you're experiencing or not experiencing, an austere mysticism of the depths is accessible. And faith, through acts of faith, believe, and you have found him. No matter how (laughs) dry that finding him may seem, no matter how matter of fact that act of faith seems, believe, and you have found him, and you can delight in his presence, you can praise him, thank him, enjoy his presence, savor him, the indwelling trinity, Father and Son breathing forth, vibrating the Holy Spirit in the depths of our heart right now. We can delight in that, give thanks to the Lord for that, savor that, whatever we're feeling or not feeling. Him begetting, the Father begetting His Son in us. You know, it's an eternity, so it's breaking forth as if for the first time right now. And then the Father begetting Son within that begetting is our own begetting by extension adoption as the children of God. And so to acknowledge that, seize hold of that in faith and hope, an austere mysticism of the depths, you can always reach down there, make those acts of faith. It helps with the continual prayer. Be able to do that. And that's what we're after, you know, the, the deep substance of substance. But the Lord needs to bring us deeper. We just can't get there on our own, right? And that's the the dark nights. That's the aridity, right? Uh, Human beings, well, let me put it this way. You know, the Lord draws us out into the desert and we're there. It's hard to find that water. We're thirsting for the Lord. Um, But we have to be confident, all right, that there is water in the desert, when we're brought there into that dryness, that aridity, there is water in the desert. We just have to dig our wells deep enough. If you dig your well deep enough, you do find that water. And it's a pure water the deeper you go. Limpid, refreshing, living water. Quenches more of the thirst the deeper you go. And it's just human nature. You know, we don't, the human race doesn't dig wells unless they have to. You know, if you settle by a river, you're not going to dig a well. You're just going to go to the river and get water. We only uh, dig wells if we have to. And we only go as deep as we need to go. (laughs) You know, you dig a little well. Oh, but then that dries out. Then you have to go deeper. And so we're not going to do it on our own. We have to be forced there. And it's dryness that forces us to dig a deeper well. To go deeper. So it's not just a matter of deciding, okay, I'm going to go deep now and doing it, knowing how to do it. It's not just that. Uh, the Lord has to make it happen, and he makes it happen through dryness, aridity, forcing us to go deeper in prayer, finding him on that deeper level, spirit to spirit, on the level of our thirst. Here's a beautiful description of that. Uh, this is from the Sisters of Bethlehem in a Livingston Manor, uh, did a retreat there. They have a little retreat in manual uh, in your hermitage when you get there. And among like the practical details, uh, all of a sudden they hit you with this uh, profound passage. Uh, so, so listen to this about dwelling in the desert. Dwelling in the desert in faith. The father sends his son as physician to heal and save what is sick and lost. It is when we recognize ourselves as such and sinful that Christ, the living physician, can accomplish an underground and miraculous work of healing. 
It implies an invincible faith in love, which transforms the person without her knowing it, beyond what she knows and feels naturally, at the measure of her thirst and faith. So God's work in our lives, it's a work of love that's underground, beneath the surface, on the level of our thirst and faith. That's the most profound transformation the Lord can bring about on that level. That's in its underground. The pilgrim in the desert must know before anything else that nothing of his sensitivity is in immediate harmony with the secret work of love in him. Right, the work of love, our first response is, that's love. <laughs> it doesn't feel like love. <laughs> That's love. Nothing of our sensitivity is in immediate harmony with this secret work of love. One must learn day by day the patient manner in which one can carry one's human sensitivity. At times so strange, so noisy, while the work of God is direct, simple, and silent. Right? We get bent out of shape about this or that. We feel this way. We feel that way. Our sensitivity is so strange, so noisy. While the work of God is direct, simple, silent, beneath the surface, underground, apprehended by faith, on the level of our thirst. No matter what man can feel about himself, he comes from love. He goes to love. All of his life is lived and based upon this love. May he know how to leave and transcend the movements of his sensitivity and become deaf to them in order to acquire an ear attuned to the true voice of love. That's going to take a lot of faith. Yes, Lord, what I'm feeling now, what I'm not feeling is a work of your love. And I believe in your love and I receive it. Believe and you have found it. Believe and you have received it. All right, so to survive in the desert, we need to dig our wells deep. We need to be uh, not like the poodle, right? But like the bulldog. The bulldog will survive in the desert. He's scrappy. There's a doggedness about him. He's low to the ground. He's humble. That bulldog will survive in the desert. He'll scratch and find water. The little poodle won't. <laughs> With the cute little bows in its hair, its uh, constellations, it's going to like shrivel up under the, the heat of the sun. <laughs> so we want to be that bulldog in the desert and, and, not, and not that poodle. But we all have a little poodle in us. We do. <laughs> we like the little bows. We like the constellations. We have that little poodle in us. And the poor little thing does need to dry up and shrivel up. <laughs> so the bulldog remains. I shared with you about Brother Honas. I'm not reading the mystics anymore. The mystics fooled me. And uh, he said, and I, he gave a little commentary, which I didn't share before. He said you know, when he was like 19 and he was reading William James and reading the mystics and he said, I want to be a mystic. Uh, and then he said, I want to be a mystic. Aren't I so pretty? <laughs> that was like the unspoken thing that he was saying at age 19. I want to be a mystic, but he was also saying, aren't I so pretty? Uh, and then he said, he said, but no, it's not about me. It's about God. Right. And that, that's, that's the true stance of, 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 of the mystic. It's not about me, it's about God. Uh, so to be that bulldog in the desert, scrappy, keep pressing on, low to the ground, humble, and seeking the face of the Lord. So this austere mysticism of the depths, and this will be my last point, um, it leads us to what I call desert prayer. Desert prayer. And uh, desert prayer is sort of this, you know, the virtues and the mean, just like sober inebriation is like virtue and the mean between the excess of too much sobriety and no inebriation and the other excess of too much inebriation, no sobriety, sober intoxication of the spirit, the middle point. 
So likewise, this desert prayer, another kind of virtues in the mean, the peak above two excesses, the valleys of two excesses. So on one side of desert prayer, uh, you have a dessert prayer. <laughs> so dessert prayer is, you know, whether you, you consciously want to be that way or not, deliberately so or probably not. Um, yeah, you're, you know, you, you want the consolations and you're kind of dependent on the consolations, the dessert prayer. So that, that's not desert prayer. But on the other side of desert prayer, uh, you have a deserted prayer. And I don't mean by deserted prayer that you're not coming to office, you're not being faithful to your times of prayer. I mean something much more subtle. You're showing up for prayer, but you have kind of given up. You have kind of deserted uh, the living relationship with the Lord. Uh, the Lazarus isn't around anymore. The seeking, the asking, the pining. You're not expecting much anymore. You're showing up, but you have kind of deserted prayer. Something very subtle. Uh, so that, that's the other thing. Uh, but in the middle, you have a desert prayer, which rises above them. It's attentive to the gentle touch of the Lord. It's in dialogue with him. Even if it's a, a, a speaking by, by silence, a speaking of desire back and forth, this conversation with the Lord on the level of our affectus. The affectus has its own language, that exchange of love back and forth, infusion of grace and loving kindness, uh, the soul crying out its wonderment and gratitude to the Lord, that back and forth with the Lord, a living relationship with him in the midst of the desert. That's desert prayer. So it's not so much, you know, in John the Cross, you can read some passages that make it sound like, okay, you have a period of darkness and that opens up to greater light. There are some passages that makes it sound like, okay, there's a, spirit, a period of silence that breaks open into a more profound word. There's a period of God's absence that breaks open into a more profound presence of God. But there are some other passages in John the Cross where it's more about um, finding light in the darkness, not light after the darkness, as much as finding light in the darkness. Not so much word after silence, but finding the word in the silence, a silence that is all word. Not so much finding God's presence after a time of seeming absence, but finding God's presence in the absence, God's presence as the hidden one. So like Dark Night, book two, chapter nine and 16 are good examples where you get some of that, that sense. It's more about the light in darkness, word in silence, beloved's presence as the one who's hidden. And so uh, here are just some, some just different phrases to describe the, this desert prayer. Some a little poetic, some a little fun, uh, but this, we'll just going through this with my last point here. So this desert prayer, it's a more immense, less perceptible. More general, less particular. More of the spirit, less detectable by the emotions. More expansive, less graspable. More intimate, less describable. More of faith, less of feeling. More constant and steady, less intense. More stable and permanent, and hence less noticed. Right, if something becomes an abiding thing in you, you're not gonna notice it as much. We speak about a connaturality with God and charity. You know, connaturality can be translated in at-homeness with God. You're being brought up into divine things and you're becoming more and more at home with them, which means you're not going to notice them as much, <laughs> right? You're in the world and you're full of distraction. So when you go to that adoration chapel for that hour, that one hour each day, the silence of that place is just going to strike you hard. The divine things are going to be so intense because you're not used to dwelling there. You enter the monastery and you become more connatural with divine things over, the, over time. 
and hence they are less perceptible, less noticeable, because there's a greater at-homeness with these things. So more stable and permanent, and hence less noticed. More abiding, less exciting. More subdued and delicate, less pronounced and obvious. More hidden presence, less appearance. More on the razor's edge of the present moment. Less what I carry from me from the past. More of an expectant gaze for the unknown. Less of a being ready for something. More seeking God's glory and honor everywhere and in all souls. Less reference to myself. Right? To, to praise the Lord as selflessly as to praise the Lord as energetically for a grace bestowed upon your sister as bestowed on you. Why not? You know, it's God's goodness in both cases. So that selflessness, being caught up in God that much. More seeking God's glory and honor everywhere in all souls, less reference to self. More being, less doing, yet being itself is an act. More stillness, less a grasping after. More oblivion, less keeping track of. Right, it's good to have times of prayer where you, you become oblivious of time. Right, like, <laughs> it's not good to watch the hourglass waiting for it to, to go to the end. <laughs> like Teresa Valla describes beginning of her, her life of prayer. It's nice to have times of prayer where, where you, you can become oblivious of time. Less keeping track of. More of a listening, less words. More word, less words. More intuitive, less conceptual. More of a pure, soft white light. Less brilliant colors. More receptive, less inert. More attention, less sleepiness. More awareness, less musings. More God, less self. More like substantial bread than a sweet dessert. More like refreshing water than a fizzy soda. More like the severe elegance of the essential than a fringe of lace. Or I think of a big monastery of stone. The severe elegance of the essential. More like the trunk of a tree than its branches. When you're riding a bike, more like coasting than pedaling. More like glowing embers than a flaming fire. More like the open sea than a detailed landscape. More like listening to the beating of his heart than hearing clear phrases. More like the twilight than high noon. More like the dawn than the twilight. More like finding the eye of a storm than fleeing the storm. So Lord, we approach you with faith, hope, and charity. We open the, the womb of our faith to receive whatever you have for us, Lord. We ask you to give us the grace that our faith may expand more and more to receive more of you. Guide us in your ways of love, however strange they may seem to us at times. And we cry out with confidence, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.